Alrighty. Hello, everyone. I'm Shannon, the Marketing and Communications Coordinator here at Directions Training. Thank you so much for joining us today for um, our Azure's Fundamental Webinar session. So if you aren't too familiar with Directions, basically we're an IT and professional development training company. So we help organizations, government entities, and individuals adopt technology through training. We also provide custom and blended training solutions to best fit various learning styles. So there's always something for everyone and different ways that they learn. All of our instructors are experts in their field and incredibly passionate about what they do. So before we get started, I want to mention a few things. If you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat box anytime throughout the webinar. And then at the end of the session, we will turn on mic access to allow for open questions. You should also see a poll box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So throughout the webinar, there will be a new question every 10 minutes or so. So if you could just take a second to fill each one out, all you have to do is select or type in your answer and it's submitted automatically. So this just helps us kind of better understand where our audience is at and improve our process for future webinars. Today we have Mike leading our webinar. His certifications include Microsoft Certified Trainer and Microsoft Certified Solutions, including MCSE Mobility, Productivity, and Cloud, along with the new Azure Admin Certification. Um, I see we've got a good amount of people joining us, so whenever you're ready, Mike, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you, Shannon. Good day out there, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day. My name is Mike Vesky. We're going to come in and look at the Azure Cloud a little bit. So hopefully everybody's ready to go and we'll get started. I want to just uh, go out to my screen because I'm going to just do the uh, presentation from my home computer and then also we'll do a little demo out there in Azure. So just give me a second. All righty. Yeah, so I'll just do a little lecture, get you guys coming forward with uh, cloud computing. And then we'll kind of look at the Azure port a little bit, do a little demos. At the end, we have a Q&A period. So if there's any questions, then Shannon will be taking those questions. But also the uh, look at the polls as we go. So most of we talk about cloud computing as going back a few years, which was virtualization. Mostly a lot of companies uh, would be virtualizing on-premise with either Hyper-V or VMware. So mostly they would call that the private cloud. So mostly you're owning those resources. So you think of things like, you know, compute or computers in general, Windows, Linux, virtual machines, which might have been running on-premise. Then they talk about lifting and shifting those uh, workloads on-premise out to the cloud. So this gets into cloud computing where you're more or less just renting resources, like, you know, it's storage or CPU, mostly using another company's computers. So you might have a data center on-premise where you're virtualizing on-premise considered a private cloud. Then you start renting services you know, within, you know, Amazon or Amazon, uh, well, Amazon, uh, Google, Windows, you know, Azure, they all pretty much offer the virtualization services. So we think of, again, storage, what they call blob, a binary large object, which is mostly just your binary data can be stored in the cloud. You might even think of that as uh, if you have like a, a OneDrive account consumer where you're just storing your, you know, you know, your family's pictures up in the cloud. You might even have your Android phone synchronized up to Google storage or your, you know, your, uh, your iPhone, you know, synchronizing up to the iCloud. All of that, again, is pretty much utilizing somebody else's data center and just storing your data up there. Some services are free, but when we get into the uh, enterprise side, mostly a lot of these would be considered enterprise services or resources, and then we have, you know, subscriptions. So you think of things like, you know, SQL databases, uh, virtual networking, spanning your on-premise environment out to the cloud through things like virtual networking, uh, virtual network gateways, uh, express routes, and then having the ability to have all that information stored within the cloud and then have the ability to go through the analytics and monitoring, analyzing, and uh, Microsoft Azure offers a, uh, a service called Security Center, which has a free tier. So as you bring in uh, virtual machines, storage, applications, it just automatically goes in and starts uh, uh, analyzing all of these resources and then coming back with recommendations of how to make those resources more secure. So we think, again, think compute power, which is probably the most major thing where people start renting or, um, you know, creating a subscription with the cloud providers and then starting creating their own virtual machines or, you know, lift and shift their own on-premise resources up to the cloud. And then all based off of your subscription services, we want to control or at least monitor what the cost of that would be because that's one of the big things or driving forces of going to the cloud is uh, hopefully saving on your budgets. 
So here we can see Azure uh, pretty much offers a lot of their data centers around the world, mostly what they call these the global services. You can see on this map, we're in, over on the left in America, we pretty much have like East Coast, West Coast, Central US. But as you look at this within the blue dots are just the available regions. These are the available regions where you can create resources now. So they have Europe pretty heavily. I think they just instituted uh, data centers there in South Africa. So Microsoft, one of the first uh, global providers to offer cloud services in, in South uh, Africa. So a couple of months ago it was at 52, now it's at 54 regions. And then of course you can also see the dotted circles would be the uh, you know data centers that are coming online, a lot of them over there in Europe. But over there in UAE, right, United Emirates, they have uh, some data centers coming up there. China's pretty big. And then Australia, which all, a couple of months ago, there was only like one or two down there. So 140 available regions. When you go in, as we'll look, and you know, you can create a trial subscription. You can actually, you know, experience the Azure experience uh, through a trial. They give you like $100 credits for a month, and then we can go in and start creating resources. What you want to be aware of is, you know, where you are in the world. So if you're in, you know, New York, then you probably want to create your resources in the East U.S. If you're in California, you'll be creating your resources in the West U.S. So depending on where you are, you're always trying to create the resources closest to you based off, you know, not introducing any latency in, into, your, into your access. Then also they have these white dots here, which are availability zones. Essentially, we talk about redundancy. You'll, you'll create resources within the region you're in like using Microsoft's cloud provider here, the data centers, which are the blue dots. And that's considered the region, East U.S. region. And you create a resource there, and it, it's automatically redundant. So that's usually one of the selling points of thinking about uh, having resources on premise like a virtual machine where you just create one virtual machine on your Hyper-V or VMware host and you have a single instance. In the cloud, as soon as we create a resource, it's automatically redundant. So you get to what they call LRS, local replication services, LRS. You create one resource and it's automatically redundant in the region you're in. So you wind up with three copies and that's a big selling point most people don't think about uh, getting into the cloud computing. And then they offer services where you can make yourself also redundant uh, across regions. Now, virtual machines are usually dedicated to the region they're in, but then you might think of other storage, like they have a file share storage or just a binary large object, just storing data that you can replicate uh, from region to region. And mostly they would call that the global replication services. But I'm just, you know, representing this because, again, like, you know, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, Azure, they're all offering these cloud services, and we're just looking at the benefits. You know, what benefits would we get out of actually, you know, lifting and shifting or creating our resources right into the cloud? So you think about the benefits of cloud computing as you know being cost effective. So there'd be no upfront costs, no need you know to purchase and manage costly infrastructure, getting away from the hardware and a lot of the configuration updates, driver level, all the things you might be experiencing uh, you know with the on-premise hardware, and the cost, right? The cost, the ability to pay for additional resources if and when they're needed. So you have like a pay-as-you-go. Right? So cloud computing can provide you as a pay-as-you-go or a consumption-based pricing model. If you're into the virtual machines, they also have now what they call reserved pricing, where you can pay forward. You can save like 20 or 30% on your overall cost. If you don't think about reserving VM processing moving forward, is you have to pay that cost up front, that's all. But you are saving uh, costs over time, pay, paying for the uh, util utilization of the virtual machine up front rather than paying as you go. So they do have different subscription plans. Another nice thing about these resources, they become scalable. Which is, again, if you're on-premise, you have to, again, have two Hyper-V hosts and then create all your resources to fail over back and forth. You have to test all that. Here in the cloud, pretty much all that server hardware is eliminated. We can just go up and make ourselves highly redundant by creating our resources and taking advantage of the LRS or the replication that's already built into the cloud. So they talk about vertical scaling, scaling up. I mean, we can create a virtual machine. Maybe that virtual machine doesn't have enough RAM, doesn't have enough CPU or processing power. So we can actually scale up that VM to the next size. And we'll take a look out here in a little bit uh, within the virtual machine. And have, you know, we'll set up somebody to actually access a virtual machine. But then there's also horizontal scaling, right? The process of adding you know, more servers. So scaling up, putting more RAM, more disk space on the single instance. Or you might get into the uh, uh, you know, load balancing. Or you, know, there, you can actually create uh, multiple virtual machines behind a load balancer. And then uh, over time, if the metrics on that VM become you know, overwhelming where the CPU is above 80% for like the last five minutes, we can auto scale just that another instance into that load balance scenario. Now these are probably more higher level enterprise uh, features, but again, Microsoft deals with the Soho, the small office, home office versus the enterprise. So essentially what you're really looking at is becomes elastic, right? Your workloads change 
uh, due to spike and drop in demands, we can just set up these auto scaling rules to help us uh, with that. And then it's always current as you go in and add your resources in. Uh, when you create a virtual machine, you'd be looking for the size. And then they have these different versions, V1, V2, V3. Uh, what we learned over time is the versioning number just lets you know that actually the data center might be on latest hardware. So like version 1 might be on older hardware, like you might have like standard disks, which are old spindle disks. And then they go into premium services where you might opt into like SSD. All right, so you're getting the faster hard drives. And as you, you know, and of course sometimes they're a little cheaper because you're on uh, newer hardware, but sometimes the larger virtual machine configurations are on the newer hardware. So you just have to look as we go in as to what you might want. And you can always change it. That's the nice thing. It's scalable. It's cost effective. And then you have your deployment models. Like I said, if you're on premise and you're just doing virtualization on premise and you're pretty much in what they call the public cloud, or excuse me, the private cloud because you're on premise, services being offered across the internet, considered cloud providers are on the public side. And then you have your hybrid, you know, spanning your on-premise environment out to the cloud. Where again, you might have a SQL database on premise, but then you put your web servers in the cloud, so the web servers will be internet facing. And then you create your virtual network from the cloud on premise, so that, you know, in some companies, uh, compliance, right, they have to control their data, so the data might still be on premise, but web services is in the cloud. So there's all the all different kinds of models there. Synchronization of even uh, users or for software as a service, synchronizing a user on premise out to the cloud, so we get that single sign on with password authentication, so no matter whether they log into on-premise services or cloud services, they're using the same uh, username and password. And as we synchronize the user out to Azure Active Directory, then we can have uh, these global uh, groups set up, dynamic groups already set up. So when a user synchronizes out, there might be like, you know, department equals sales. We have applications already in Azure Active Directory where the application says, you know, if the user's uh, attribute department equals sales, they're automatically added to the group. Therefore, as soon as they synchronize out to the cloud, they have automatic access to the applications. So automation, scalability, that's pretty much all in the mix. So I bring in this chart because this really represents uh, pretty much everything in a nutshell. So over to the left on-premise again, whether you're just dealing with on-premise, you're dealing with everything. So from the bottom up, you set up your network, you have your storage on-premise, the cost there, all the server's hardware that you're installing, and you know, the patch level, the operating system. And then you can think below virtualization might be just, again, right, you're having Hyper-V, VMware on-premise where you're virtualizing your own environment or just a physical environment. But again, you're doing all the patching, you're in control of the middleware, the runtime environment, the data is most important, right? Like, like I said, a lot of times companies still protect that data on-premise, but then the applications. So what you do is they call it infrastructure as a service, IaaS, infrastructure as a service, where we're eliminating the hardware layer. And then all we do is we utilize our cloud service providers to create our virtual machines. So this, again, is where we can virtualize. We have the, the virtual network. Right? We create a virtual network. We want to make sure that if we create a virtual network and we span on-premise out to the cloud, that our IP address spaces don't overlap. That's always a big thing. We want to make sure that the virtual network's spanning. If we need that, then we're just creating our uh, you know, web applications in the cloud, our virtual machines, and then we also have our storage out there. Then, of course, they go into platform as a service which this mostly deals with, uh, again, mostly just the applications. So you still have the networking storage servers. But again, platform as a service is just more or less utilizing uh, the applications right, rather than the whole, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole configuration. So platform as a service is just looking at the application layer and just eliminating right, the hardware layer below it. And then we have software as a service, which we'll look at this uh, based off some of the demo I'm going to do is you know having the enterprise applications within Azure Active Directory and having the ability to assign those out to certain users and not really have to deal with the installs. Right? So the software as a service, we, we have subscription services, we'll subscribe to them, but essentially the, the company, the company is buying the licensing and the user just logs into the application without even worrying about licensing. So in software as a service, usually the software is already licensed by the company and then we're just targeting you uh, based off policy coming down to either the mobile device or the user's login to get those applications out there. And we'll take a look at that based off. This is, again, one of the services they offer. So offers a service in the enterprise. And then that also goes into the gallery, the, the Azure gallery with all the software that can be offered. And then platform as a service, sometimes they'll call that a serverless compute because all we're really dealing with is the web app. And then, you know, there's a little bit of gray here between, you know, the development side and the administration. We can create the web app. Somebody comes up and develops against it. But then again, right, we don't have to worry about the hardware. We're just worrying about the app. Because if you think about infrastructure as a service, well, you're still dealing with the operating system. 
So your patch level, uh, you still have to deal with the update management. And the big dividing factor here is do you still need it? Do you still need the whole IIS web server? Because that's the thing. We can actually deploy uh, Linux virtual machines and uh, Windows virtual machines. What we want to think of, though, is we have that, like, you know, an Apache server or an IIS web server, we have to pretty much take advantage of the whole configuration. So all the updates we're in control of versus on-premise, which we're always in control of, and then platform as a service just dealing with the applications. So we're always looking right, to deploy things that are current in the cloud, and that's really where Azure comes forward. We're always having new features being presented and always making sure right, that all those resources are most current. So what we're going to look at here is mostly, uh, yeah, spinning up a virtual machine through infrastructure as a service, and then we'll take a look at software as a service, uh, deploying enterprise applications through licensing. So I'll go and take a, a demo of the portal here. We'll get you in and take a look at the portal here based off. Uh, mostly what I want to look at is the demo of the, the portal. So most people that are not used to Azure or cloud service providers in general, we can just go in and you know take a look at the dashboard real quickly. And then we'll come back and kind of look at some of the other things based off virtual networking. All right, so let me come down here. All right, so I'm going to get logged in here into my Azure account. So like I said, you can go up, uh, look just for look for Azure trial. There's a couple of them. There's corporate trials, there's government trials, and there's just regular trials. Like a, a regular trial would give you a key to create an Azure trial with, give you $100 in credits for 30 months. And then you have to pretty much track that through cost analysis, and we'll take a look. So let me get logged in here. So I'm going to go with my account. And we're off and running there. Let's see. Off and went on. Like that. All right, so we get logged in, and mostly what we see is the main portal. Right up at the top, I have a Microsoft account as an MCT. So I have a summary resources available to me up to $100 limit. And when you come in, you pretty much have, well, three or four places that you mostly concentrate. All in the upper left, you'd have the ability right, to start pushing out all of the Azure resources based off create a resource, where you can push out your virtual machines, virtual networks. You also have... This screen, when you log in, you usually see this screen, which gives you the ability right, to spin up virtual machines, uh, deal with storage accounts. Uh, you can also be dealing with the app services. Let me just come over here for a second. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, so we have the ability right, to spin up our app services or deploy our apps here. Uh, there's all different kinds now. SQL databases, the Cosmos database, or just having a SQL database within a virtual machine. All right, we have the Postgre uh, SQL. Sometimes they'll say no SQL, where it's just maybe a, a, a queue where they have you know name and value pairs. But essentially, the developer doesn't need a whole SQL database. They only need you know a couple of you know tables, name and value pairs to store some data in. So yeah, they have different flavors of uh, SQL, SQL Cosmos, and then they also have the uh, uh, the connectors, right? The container services like Kubernetes and Docker. So there's just so many things we can offer here in the little time we're talking. But as we create things. As we create things in Azure, we always talk about a resource group. So as you would come up all the way to the left and say, let's create a resource, and then you want to come down here, maybe create a storage account, or maybe you're into you know, uh, creating your virtual networks within the cloud, storage accounts. All these things, again, if we select them, we want to make sure that they're being stored somewhere using a resource group. So that's usually what you want to focus on first is where am I going to store these resources within a resource group? So over here, as you log into the portal down here, you have resource groups. So we come up and create a resource, and you could be a computer, network, all right, storage, web, mobile. So a lot of these get into the applications. Here's your container services for like Kubernetes, Docker, also deploying containers in Linux machines, spinning up databases here, and having the database connect to a virtual machine in the cloud or on-premise. But there's a lot of stuff going on that you want to look at. So create resources is a great place to start, especially if you're thinking about virtual machines. So I'll click on Compute, and I can start deploying a you know Windows 2016 data center server. If I'm not if I'm not quite sure what I'm doing or I'm new to it, then right here you have like Quick Start tutorials, and then you also have your Learn More. So the Learn More will always take you out to an Azure Tech article to teach you more about what this is. All right, so pretty much here you can you know it gives you a little blurb about what the virtual machine would be, but also you have the Learn More, which usually takes you out to a Tech article. And of course you have the Quick Start tutorials. Would also shoot you out to the Azure Tech article, and they give you a lot of five-minute tutorials. So if you can create a you know trial account, you can start uh, doing this here real quickly without much effort. Other than that, like I say, you log in, you have the home. Right at the top, you might notice they've added this home page in here a couple of months ago. It used to be you logged in, you hit the dashboard right away. So up here, they do give you a choice as to whether you want to default to the home page login here or you want to default to the dashboard. 
the dashboard gives you more uh, the dashboard gives you more custom customized uh, ability right to add tiles so I'll just click over here on the left and click on dashboard yeah so I mean you usually come up and you have tiles here and you can add them in on the upper left you have a drop down on my dashboard you would create multiple dashboards so you might have one dashboard for all your virtual machines another dashboard for all your virtual networks or applications so all you have to do is just hit the plus and you can create a whole new dashboard over on the left they have these widgets and gadgets you can drag in like here's a clock I can add or maybe I'm just trying to monitor service health in Azure down here I have all my account summary so it's just scroll 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 there's so many things you can add in to create a custom dashboard all right once I'm done customizing this the way I'd like it I can just go up here and say done customizing and you can see the clock over here also has a little bit of you know configuration if I need to be in a different time zone and so we just have different dashboards. Let's go back here, back to my other dashboard. Yeah, so you can upload. These dashboards can be saved. You can actually configure the dashboard the way you like it. You can download it. Saves it as what they call a JSON file, a JavaScript object notation file, just a JSON file. It looks kind of looks like XML. And then you can, you know, customize your portal here and take it over to somebody else and import it. And, of course, the whole portal looks just like yours. So download, upload the configuration of the portal. Editing will take me back into, obviously, modifying it again. And then we can share. You can actually share your uh, dashboard out here if you need other people to see it. You can go full screen. You can clone the dashboard if you you know you put a lot of work into it. You don't want to you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So you can clone your dashboard and modify it further. So this is a great place to start. Like I say, if you want to log in here, like the home gives you that toggle button at the top. If you lose this toggle button, over on the right you have a gear icon. Right? All the way in the right you have a gear icon. This helps you again. Sometimes I'll log in and I only have a white screen and white can hurt your eyes a little bit so you might just come down here and you know change the actual theme if you want right there's black if you want to go with black like an old terminal or sometimes I'll just go with blue but right in right down here it actually asks you again if you want to you know all new resources browse experience if you want to disable that and right here choose your default view which is the home page or maybe I want to just you know, every time I log in I want to see my dashboard so that's up to you but there, again there's a lot to look at when you start looking at it it's just a great place to start so either create a resource here, and they call this the marketplace. You're pretty much looking at the marketplace, right? Azure Marketplace and all these particular features. Click on a feature, and you get more features inside here. And then you down here have all services, just another way to find things. Matter of fact, if you look for all services this way, and maybe I'm looking for, like, identity services for later. Right? I'll just type an ident up here. It'll filter real quickly, and then here I'll be messing with my identity protection or privilege identity management. So maybe I'm going to use these. So instead of searching and digging for them all the time, right here at the top, if you search for something within all services, you'll see right next to the feature you're looking for is a star. All I have to do is click on that star, and then it pins it over here to my favorites bleed. So that's what they kind of call it. Every time you click on a window and it opens up, Azure's calling it a bleed. So sometimes over here on the left, the, the favorites, they may call it the favorites hub or the favorites bleed. So now that I have that pinned, I can click on it and that'll open up that particular blade and now I'm into that particular feature right, one of many features thousands of features out here <laughs> it just it keeps going so you have navigation with right, the all services you can scroll through pinning them to your favorites blade uh, at the top again you do have this uh, filter at the top this one at the top is actually pretty nice because if you look for things in the search resource at the top you actually get uh, Azure Techno articles. So maybe I'm again looking for identity. I'll click on identity down here again. It'll give me the services that are available in the marketplace. But then it also gives me other things down here like documentation. So if I'm looking to create identity for applications or you know use PowerShell or some documentation down here already ready to go, I can just click on it and I'm automatically into that Azure Techno article. So a lot of places to look for things to get going. Uh, all the way over here, they got the little smiley face. This whole portal is constantly being changed. I know in the government, probably not as much, but in the global side, there's always new features coming in. Pretty much every 45 to 90 days, Microsoft's bringing in new features, or there's things in preview that are being released now into a real feature. So just be looking for that. And of course, if you have problems like, I don't really like this, I don't really like that, then provide that feature information to Microsoft. Microsoft's team is always looking at everything. They take your suggestions to heart. So if you need help, obviously contact them, but also let them know that you're, you know, this is nice or that's that's a terrible feature. And they'll definitely listen to your information. You can submit that off to Microsoft's support team. Question mark again, just you know, help and support. If you and mostly if you're a 
because there's kind of multiple levels. Like a global admin like I am right now has complete access to everything. And then below him would be like a user manager and then maybe a password admin as far as right role-based administration. But even an end user, just somebody that logs in, might need support spinning up a virtual machine or accessing a SQL database. So there can always right, create your support ticket here. Yes, yeah, so there's other things like diagnostics and roadmaps. The gear icon in for uh, customizing your portal. And then everything we create, there'll always be notifications. Sometimes you'll log in, like me right now with my uh, subscription. It's actually telling me over here how much money I have left on my, uh, my trial. I have an MSDN subscription with Microsoft because I'm a trainer. So they give me 100 bucks a month, and as I start spinning up services, it just starts eating up, eating up those credits. At the time I used up all my credits, I can either A, opt in to pay as you go. If I want to keep those services going, I just you know go into a real trial, take my trial into a real subscription, and then start you know paying pay as you go or pay forward with you know uh, reserved instances. But if I don't, if I don't subscribe to services, then my trial just shuts down. For me, I'll get another hundred bucks next month. But for you, you'd have to actually opt into subscription services if you're really going to start using them, you know, in the real world. So hopefully that kind of makes sense, right? Favorites Blade, all of the resources in the upper left for creating resources, home dashboard, and searching for services, being able to pin them to the Favorites Blade, searching in the middle, and of course all the other icons in the upper right. So there's just a lot of things there, right? Core Azure Services, resource groups. So as you create these resources, as you go in and create a resource, it's always best to, and it's organizational skills, really. It's just your organizational skills coming into play. And trying to, they talk about life cycle, like objects or resources that might share a common life cycle were probably in the same resource group. Or you might think about it regionally, like we have an East Coast resource group, a West Coast resource group, and we might do that for like East Coast billing and West Coast billing. Or again, we have a developer. Developer is going to start developing his SQL databases and his web apps. And then we'll put all his stuff in one resource group and then assign him permissions to the resource group. When he logs in, that's all he sees. So we can think about resource grouping as organizational skills, putting different projects together for different people to only see and have you know full access to that with nothing else in the portal. So there's a lot of different reasons we might use resource groups. But the resource can only be stored in one resource group, just so you know. You create a virtual machine, is stored in one resource group. And that, again, helps us with tracking and, and, and billing also because we can look at cost per resource group. The resource group, again, might have a resource group just for virtual networking, which might inclu include your subnets or the region. Look at the regions. Regions are very important. If I create a virtual network in East U.S. and I create a virtual machine in the West U.S., I will not be able to put that virtual machine in the East U.S. virtual network. So regions are very important. I won't be able to see the virtual network if it's not in the same region as the virtual machine. Same with storage. We can create storage accounts. Storage accounts can be accessible across multiple regions or even virtual networks. But then again, mostly creating a storage account closest to you or within the resource group, like if we're going to use a web app and a web app needs storage, we'll put that storage account in the same resource group as the web app, and then we can control those resources together. You kind of get the idea, organizational skills. App services, web front end, or maybe you're just you know dealing with a static website or forms based website. There's just a lot of different app services we have. Just go to Create Resource, look for web, and you'll see all the app services available within the Azure Marketplace, which is pretty much, I gave you, uh, you know, I just did a little screen capture on the right here, showing the same thing we just saw based on all the features available within the Marketplace. Identity services is big, uh, business to business, business to consumer, Azure Active Directory. So mostly that's where we'll start creating our users. And we have a lot of things in there based off self-service, people being able to reset their own passwords, uh, there's uh, dynamic group membership. There's self-service in uh, getting yourself into an application by requesting access to a group. So the group's associated to the app. You request access to the group. You have access to the app. Then there's deep log analytics like data lake analytics, HD insights. There's a lot of things going on as far as like Hadoop and other things that we can look at uh, based off you know large capacity storage and things. And then, yeah, they have uh, Azure machine learning, which is another big thing they have which is being able to you know, track uh, all of the different things going on within the cloud based off Azure Machine Learning. So there's a lot of things they talk about uh, based off uh, AI, right, artificial intelligence, and there's a lot of things we can actually deploy, right, create resources within the cloud that are available to us. But then as we go in and you know, create subscription services, a lot of guys love the command line. So instead of deploying services like right to a virtual machine, they're deploying it through the command line. So we have the Azure CLI, which is kind of an old, kind of looks like old DOS, but we can actually do command line options rather than, you know, uh, deploying it through the shell or the portal. 
we have the ability right, to do scripting. So CLI, PowerShell, being able to deploy resources that way. A little bit more complicated, but if you're if you if you're savvy within the scripting methods, then you can look at the Azure CLI rather than the portal. You can actually click on the top. There's a little icon there you click on, and it opens up the actual uh, what they call the bash shell, or just the, the shell that we can actually run PowerShell commands in our Azure CLI. With all that being said, there's a lot of other things they go into content management. So like uh, if you're familiar with you know storage providers like Akamai or other things where they might have large storage areas, then the ability right to have the content delivery network, having your content being delivered within different regions. Mostly what they do there is like somebody in China might come over here, you know, to, to look at your web page and then they're looking at the graphics, but the graphics are actually in the United States, but actually being serviced over in China. What you really want to do is you want to make sure the content is being provided closest to where the user is. So there's no latency in the delivery of, you know, because when we talk about content delivery, it's usually about media, you know, streaming media like Netflix and Google Video, YouTube. A lot of those are streaming services, and they're pretty much being offered over the content delivery network. You can also take advantage of those within Azure Core Services. Then it's load balancing your websites, Traffic Manager, which actually helps you load balance your websites. So again, when somebody comes in from China and they access a website here, we could have replicated that website into China's data center so that when they access it, it's closest to them and not pretty much coming all the way across the pond, let's say, right, to get that resource. So there are more enterprise-level features, but again, you might have a lot of features in accessibility, and you don't want to have it all within your region. You want to be able to span over multiple, uh, you know, multiple regions in general. So let's see, we'll come down here. Yeah, so the Azure demo we have, right? So we're pretty much looking at the portal and a lot of the services, and I want to come in here and look at this demo, mostly based off, again, yeah, creating a user, having the, so pretty much like a story scenario here. We have a user who's going to start developing applications, so this user needs access to a resource group to store his web apps in. So that's kind of what I figured I'll do here based off the demo is create a user, create a resource group, assign the user, and then also looking at the resource groups, right, storing all of our stuff in a resource group. All right, so let me go out and we'll try that one. All right, let me see here. Oh, we're going to just put that over here, okay. Yeah, so we're doing good there. So we'll come over here and look at the resource group. So most of you would come in and right on the favorites, we have resource group. So again, I'm a global admin, just got a request that we got a developer coming in who needs a virtual machine, some access to a web app. So we'll come in and we'll create a resource group for him to store his resources in. All right, so we'll just come up here to the resource group and we'll add a resource group. So most of you come in, like I say, you'll dedicate this resource group to your subscription. Some companies might have multiple subscriptions. Right now I only have one, so I'll use the MSDN subscription, and then I'll give this guy a name. So what we want to do here is, uh, you know, I'll say Mike Resource Group. All right, we'll just call it to, uh, yeah, Mike Resource Group. So this is Mike's resource group, whoever that Mike is. He's a developer, and Mike is in East U.S. So I'm going to come down here and make sure that Mike's resource groups, all of his resources are in East U.S. All right, and then we'll just go ahead and create that resource group. And then we'll just stop, start dropping our resources into that resource group and make sure Mike has full control of that resource group. And so we'll create it here. Now, you can create resource groups during the creation of resources. I like to have it ready to go. It just seems to be best practice to have the resource group ready to go and then the uh, permissions assigned to it. So that's easy enough to go ahead down here and create ourselves a resource group. As you come into the basics and you just think, okay, the resource group, resources in the resource group in a specific region, up here you also have the ability of what they call tags. So as we start deploying things into the resource group, here's where you have the ability to create a name and value pair. And then you can associate the name and value pair, a tag, to resources later. We can actually go in and say, give me all these resources that are tagged this way. And then I can actually go in and you know, create a spreadsheet or a, uh, you know, a cost analysis against all those tags. So this resource might have a specific tag that we can calculate against. Otherwise, if there's no tags, you'll create and review. And if there's no errors here, we'll just go ahead and create that resource group. There we go. So most like I said, as you, as you create a resource group up here in the uh, notification icon, you'll always get, you know, what's being created. Green's always good. And if you say go to resource, it'll take you right to that specific resource you just created. You can go right there. You can also pin. You can pin that resource right to the dashboard so it's available all the time. Like mostly in this resource group on the upper right, they give you a pin, and then you can actually pin this resource group right to the dashboard if you wanted to. So I just pin on that, and I can pin that right to this dashboard. So if I go to this dashboard, right over here, we can actually see where those resources have just been pinned. 
that's up to you if you want to you know take advantage of the pinning. Like I have a lot of guys creating different dashboards and pin different things to it based off what we're looking at. You know, you're a developer and you're only dealing with SQL databases, or you're, you're somebody else only dealing with virtual networks. You might have all, you know, everybody might have a different. It's almost like when you go in and somebody's laptop and they got so many shortcuts on a desktop. Like, how do you find anything? It's kind of like that. You have so many dashboards. You'll know where things are, but when I look at it, I may not know what to look at, right? Because there's just so many things you can pin here. So other than that, we'll come down here, and I'm going to click into Azure Active Directory. This will allow us to create some users. So identity service is always a big thing. So we're going to go in here and create a user. It's mostly the developer that's going to have the resource group available to them. All right, so we'll go in here to users. And we'll go up here and create a new Azure user. So mostly this is, again, Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory, not like Active Directory on-premise. It's a pretty flat database, what they call a REST API. There's no OU structure. There's no group policy. So we have Azure policy, mostly read or write. You're either an owner of the resource, you're a contributor of the resource, which means I'm going to give you uh, ability to do anything on that resource, but you can't give it away. An owner can give away rights. A contributor has rights, but can't give them away. And then there's a reader. A reader can log into the console, see everything, but he can't do anything to anything. So I'm going to create here a user. I'll make them a contributor to that resource group, so they can go into that resource group and add things to it. Right, so I'll call this guy Harry. I might as well just say Harry Smith. And his login or his single sign-on UPN will be Harry at my uh, domain name, which is circlev.net. And it's just a matter here, you know, saying if he needs any profile information. Now, usually this is a cloud account. This account will be created right in the cloud. Harry will log in right to cloud services. Harry could be a member on-premise also. He could be a member of a company where you have Active Directory on premise. In that instance, you might start synchronizing, synchronizing Harry's account on premise out to the cloud. If you're using you know, the Active Directory synchronization services or AD Connect, then Harry's account shows up in Azure AD, but it's grayed out. In other words, if I want to modify his attributes, I'd have to modify it on premise. And that would be a hybrid account, synchronizing on premise out to the cloud. If I create Harry right here in the cloud, I have full control over his account. And so it would be Harry Smith. And his job title, again, might be sales or something. Actually, he's a developer, so right, we'll say he's a developer. If I could type, I'd be good, right? <laughs> there you go, get in there. And department, wherever it be. Groups, that's it down here, you got it okay to put that into effect. And then, yeah, you got properties, more properties, more attributes on the account. Right, he's Azure Active Directory created here, otherwise that's the start of authority. Uh, what they call the control plane, right? Where do we actually modify and access the account in the cloud? Start of authority is Azure. He could be involved in groups. These groups might automatically give him access to applications, like these groups might already have apps associated. So if I just add him into IT or down here, remove them, maybe make him a staff. This application is already associated to staff. And then we'll select that. The only thing with these accounts is when you create an account, you always get the mini password. So your job is always to get that mini password out to the user. He'll log in, and pretty much he'll be forced to change his password at the first login. It's right, so setting up a simple account here for Harry. That is a Q, right? Q-U-I-A? <laughs> okay. And, yeah, it's, it's, you don't really get the option here, just show password. But as soon as he logs in, it's already triggered to change password at the first login. And there's Harry. Now, we need to get Harry a virtual machine. All right, so we'll come down here and give Harry a virtual machine. All right, so in here on our favorites hub, we have the virtual machines. So up here, we'll add a machine in. Now, this would be going the longhand way through the Azure Marketplace. I'm going to pick up a virtual machine and deploy it, which will take me through a couple of screens, and you'll see some of the things we talked about as far as cloud services. So I'll add another virtual machine in. Again, I'm, um, I'm dedicating it to my subscription, and where do you think I'm going to put it? All right, where do you think I'm going to put it? I'm going to put in that resource group that, again, Harry's going to have access to. All right, so here's Mike's RG. I should have called it Harry's RG, but I, right, we're going to give Harry full control of that, or at least contributor access to that resource group. I'll just call this VM03. We will store it in the East U.S. region, which is dedicated to where the resource group is. Right? We should always make sure our resources. Best practice, we, you don't have to. You can put this in a different region than the resource group, but your best practice is, again, right, to <laughs> always put the resource in the resource group. Same region, best practice. 
yeah, we're going to spin up here a 2016 data center server. You have other options. Linux is big. Almost half of all virtual machines being deployed in Azure right now are Linux. But I'll do a 2016 server. And then we get into the sizes. You can see the size change there. So this is where you'd scale up later. You can always scale. Like maybe I'll start at a certain size. Like I have a, you know, D to SV3 latest hardware versus V2. But the thing is, again, V2 gives me what one virtual CPU, 3.5 gigs of RAM, and I can add up to four data disks. Is where if I take the D2 V3, I'm automatically having two virtual CPUs, eight gigs of RAM, and the data disk. And then over here, you can see the cost. They're giving you a rough cost of what this would be, you know, what the rough cost is uh, being being able to run it all month. So 730 hours, I think, at 730 hours, that would be the total cost per month. So, yeah, I can start small and always scale up later if this virtual machine doesn't have enough power. So I'll select that. Always got to give it your local login. So I'm going to call this guy Lab Admin. And I'll give him a password real quickly. And it has to be at least one uppercase, one lowercase. Well, at least one uppercase and one uh, one character. And so you can pass the, <laughs> the password match there. If you need access, if you need access to the virtual machine, if it was Linux, it would probably be port 22 for SSH. But if you want to RDP into this machine, then down here, it start opening up the ports. And then down here, would actually tell it what ports do I need to open. Now, I don't need to do it this way because I can do it when I get into the actual management. And then down here, this is, again, if you own licenses. If you already own a license, like let's say you're on-premise, you're lifting and shifting your virtual machines up to the cloud, and you have some licenses. You own licenses. So I pay full price. Why not start saving money if you're already on a license? About 50% off the price. So think about $72 would cut in half if you own your own license. Then you get your disks. Virtual machines are what they call page blobs. They're a storage account, and it's a page blob. It's a special format just for virtual hard disks. So by default, you're going to get an SLA, service level agreement, if your disks are on premium SSD. If you choose anything else other than premium, you will not get the SLA, service level agreement with Microsoft. Right, premium SSD disks gives you the, the premium SLA. Then down here you can see they call them managed disks. Managed disks never show up. If I say no, then I'm using an unmanaged disk, which means I'm in control of the storage. No longer is Azure in control of that storage, therefore the SLA is now broken. If I go with managed disks, I'm meeting the premium SSD, and Azure is managing the disks, and I'm getting the SLA. Big thing here is usually this is set up prior. Somebody probably set up a virtual network prior to me deploying a virtual machine. If not, it will deploy the virtual network during this deployment. I want to put this over in the East US. I have a virtual network already set up for East US virtual machines. So this is in the East US, same as my resource group. So I can see it. Subnet, I'm going to put this virtual machine in the default subnet that's created off of that virtual network. This virtual machine will be internet facing. So it's going to bind a public IP address. So again, if I didn't have one created, this will be created. You can see it says new. So it's just going to create one, and it'll bind a dynamic IP address, internet facing to the virtual machine, so I can access it through RDP. So right here, allow ports. So if I just do that, it automatically enables the ports I need, like 3389. All right? Or it'll create what they call an NSG, a network security group, which is really just a set of rules that apply inbound, outbound firewall rules, like port 80, 443, whatever ports are open. Right, right now, it's only going to open up 3389 for RDP, but later on, I can go into the NSG because this creates a network security group, and I just create an inbound rule. If I need to open up port 80 for web services, I'll have to do that later. So again, it has to have a value or it won't create it, so I'll just say 3389. And so inbound ports are open. Accelerated networking is off. Right, You need special VMs for this. You need the hyper hyperscale VMs to take advantage of accelerated networking. And if this virtual machine was going to be dropped in behind the load balancer, then I would have not put a public IP address. If virtual machines are dropped into load balancers, usually load balancers might be already internet facing. So I just put a virtual machine in through the back end, and I don't have to worry about the front end. But that's, again, load balancing, which is no. Management has all these extensions and diagnostic logging. So if you get a chance, take a look at this. Then not have time to go through it all. But mostly, again, performance, diagnostic logging, boot diagnostics. You can turn your virtual machine into a service principal name so developers can access this as a device through a security principal name. You can set up a schedule to automatically shut down this virtual machine at a certain time and date or turn it off, and then you're in control. And then backups, right? 
There's also the Azure Backup Site Recovery, being able to back up the virtual machine within the region it's in, and then being able to restore the virtual machine based off the snapshots that are created on the backup. So extensions, like I say, desired state configuration, anti-malware. There's dozens of extensions we can add into these virtual machines. And it's right there in the name. Extensions provide post-deployment, configuration, and automation. Automation. So be taking a look at that because there's a lot of things in the system that are going to help you with, you know, PowerShell scripts, uh, Azure run books, all kinds of things that we can set up now for automation. And then tagging it. All right, like Harry... VM. So later on, I can search on Harry's VM, and I'll find it directly, and then I can start billing Harry for this virtual machine access. Everything that's involved with this virtual machine. I can tag it, and now I'm going to search, see all the resources based on billing that I can now, you know, maybe bill Harry's department based off this virtual machine. So everything, again, is create and review. All right, if it comes up green, which it should, I didn't miss anything. There you go. It's validated. It's passed, and I'll go ahead and create it. Now, just based off our limitations, I'm going to go over here uh, to this resource group. And just so you can see, because I'm going to create Harry, but I did do one here already uh, based off, uh, I think, uh, Sam. So I created this resource group. And the resource group is a virtual machine. And if I go up here into this virtual, uh, this resource group with this virtual machine, which is VMO2, I go up to the what they call access control. And I go up here and I added, I think on in this instance I added Sam. So you know, so I've got to wait for that virtual machine to get completed. I'll go over to the resource group that VM is in and I'll give it to Harry. Same way, I'll go over and bring Harry in as adding a role assignment. And then when I add a role assignment, I'll add in Harry as a contributor, right, to this resource group. I'll add Harry in as a contributor. Then he has full access to everything in the resource group and he logs in. That's all he says. All, that's all he sees is the resources in this resource group. So I did that here to Sam. You can see Sam down here is a reader account. He's able to read this everything in the resource group. So when he clicks in, he sees the resource group. He clicks on the virtual machine. He sees the he sees the virtual machine. He can connect to the virtual machine. All he needs is the credentials to that virtual machine to get logged in. But he has readability at the resource group level, which means he can't create anything. Readability, he can't create anything. A contributor could create, like Harry is going to be a contributor. He'll be able to create virtual machines in his resource group. Here, Sam only has access to what's already in the resource group. I went over here to Azure Active Directory. I went into Enterprise Apps. You can go up here and you can add in Enterprise Apps. This is the software as a service gallery. So you have the regular marketplace, the other marketplace for virtual machines, networking, web apps. Then over here you have software as a service gallery where you literally have over 3,000 applications available to you based off all the different uh, categories here. All right, so I added an app in. Wait a little bit, and then over here, again, I have an Expensify app. So I added the app in, and I go into Expensify, and I added in my users. All right, so under Manage, I added in Sam. There he is. So I added Sam in. Then I go over to my single sign-on. I say, well, Sam's going to sign in here as a password, just a password-based sign-in. All right, so I made a password-based sign-in, added Sam in here, and I click on Sam. Then up here, I have the ability to have corporate-controlled con credentials. Right? That's the big thing about software as a service. You go out, you purchase the application, you assign the application to all your users, and it's already licensed. Come the day that the user leaves, I'll just take the, I'll just uncheck the box, right? take them out of here, and the user is no longer licensed. So I can control these credentials. I, I put these credentials in. Right, Sam clicks on the app, wherever it is, clicks on it. They go right out to the application, and then I'm cor they don't have to worry about credentials. It's corporate controlled. So I've assigned an application to Sam. I've assigned a virtual machine to Sam, and I gave Sam a login. So up here, I think, yep, see up here, that one for Harry's still spinning, so we're going to have to let that go. Same procedure, though, for Sam. Right, so I'll log out here, and we'll log in as Sam. If I log in as Harry, I don't have to reach it. It's because I already did Sam. Log that as Sam, reset his password, log back in. Harry would also be forced to reset his password. All right, so here's another account. We'll log in as Sam. All right. Sign in here. Let's see how much we got to do. Zip, that's the wrong, wrong. I always do the wrong account. Sorry. Oops. <laughs> it's the wrong domain. Ah. No, 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 no. 
Yeah, I see that. <laughs> I clicked on create user instead of new user. Let's go back to that. Portal.azure.com, huh? There you go. We'll find Sam at the right domain. There we go. And you can see this graphic behind. Uh, they went in and they branded the site. So that's being, I might put the company logo in there so I know I'm in the right portal. So there is branding on the portal. Again, Sam gets logged in. We gave Sam access to this resource group. As a reader, he sees the resource group. Now, if you log, if you remember two minutes ago when I logged in as Mike, there was about seven different resource groups in there, right? Sam only sees the one that has the readability on. So in that resource group is this virtual machine. Remember when I logged in as Mike, we just created a virtual machine for Harry, and there was also a VM1 in there. All right, so Sam doesn't see it. Sam only has access to the resources he has readability on. We gave him readability on this virtual machine, which is in that resource group. We click on the virtual machine. Then over here, he has the ability to connect. Now, mostly the admin. I'm doing this because we can see everything. But really, all he needs is the IP address. He just needs the credentials and the IP address, and he can RDP into that virtual machine across any cloud. Right? He could be anywhere in the world and access that virtual machine as long as the port's open, right? into the IP address. But that's all he really needs. But he can, he can click up here and connect. If he's in the portal, he has readability on the virtual machine, so now he has the ability to download the RDP file, which will help him connect right into the virtual machine. So here he can download the RDP file, shows him what port he needs to have open, gives him the public IP address. We'll just go ahead and open it, connect in. And again, as long as the port's open, it's being, you're being prompted to get logged in. All right, so when I created the virtual machine, it asks me for the NSG port 3039 is automatically open, so I can remote into this machine automatically. I just need to know the credentials. So I'll go in as lab admin. And the password I gave it. Then you should connect. Oh, of course I gotta type my name right, right? <laughs> you get the idea. Just save on. Yeah, so I get, you know, log in, get the right user credentials, and I'm logged in that virtual machine, I'm off and running. Other than that, I'll see you in class because there's a lot more to talk about, right, based off all the features of the virtual machine, the, the networking, which was the NSG. So this is the port 3039. It was open. The reason I can access this virtual machine. There are other features in Azure which I could block. I could block access to this based off a time interval. Just-in-time access would allow me to block the port, and it only opened up for a time interval. Disks, security, extensions, and down here, a bunch of monitoring. There's boot diagnostics and everything else that we're kind of looking at real quickly. But again, I'll see you in class. There's AZ courses now that are offered, and uh, you can take those, and we can need you know, a whole day or two based off just virtual machines. What Sam can do also, let's get that application, myapps.microsoft.com. Right, Sam's already logged in, should pass through his account out here to the My Apps portal. All right, we put Sam in the group and gave him Expensify, and here it is. Now, if, he, if, if, Sam, if Sam was an 0365 subscriber, he would also see all the O365 apps in here. So you have the O365 portal, and then now you have the My Apps portal. And the My Apps portal also shows you software as a service and also the O365 apps, but also exposes the ability for the user to come in and see what groups he's in. So this can also be self-service. He can click on groups, groups that he owns, or groups I'm in, or maybe he can join a group. Is there any groups out there he can join? Like here's IT. Can he join IT? Right, the group is not available to join. So it's, it's, it's available, but it's static. Right? I can't join it dynamically. But that's, again, a lot of features on the user side. All right, so we get the user in there, right? get some deployments in the virtual machine, and then also all the software as a service apps that are available to the user. <clears throat> so other things that we can talk about, and we'll have to look at it later. But, yep, subscription costs, always making sure, again, we have the security center and looking at all the resources we have. Mostly there's also the pricing calculator. So if you're looking at the pricing of, you know, storage or virtual machines, right, there's also the pricing calculator you can look at. And then the network security group, being able to see what ports are, what's, you know, what's open, what's not, based off the things we have in Security Center, which is really what this screen's all about. Putting MFA on the user. So, you know, if the user uh, needs, again, right, more than one credential, we can use the multi-factor authentication to log a user in. And there's role-based administration. I kind of showed you role-based administration based off IAM, the user having the ability to have read access on the resource group and be able to access those resource in the resource group. So based off of that, guys, I'm pretty much going to have to kick out of here. Uh, and let me see, come back to here. 
and let me go back to this. Because pretty much, yeah, we're pretty much at the end point there, right? So it's pretty much going to conclude today's session. I'm going to encourage everyone to visit directiontraining.com to get more information about the classes we offer. Like I say, there's the AZ courses. I'll probably try to complete this uh, immersion, or not the immersion, but the webinar, right? We'll try, we do them every month. So next month is the, uh, Windows 2019, and I also think there's a little bit of Azure involved in that. But again, I encourage everybody to visit the directiontraining.com website and to check out the corresponding classes. There's the AZ100 and AZ101 courses that you can look at based off Azure Admin or Azure Architect. And that would be the MS100, MS200, and MS300, which also bleeds over to the Office 365 series. So again, I appreciate you joining us today, and if we hope to see you again in a class real soon. Other than that, let's see, is there anything else out there, Shannon? I think we're good. If um, anyone has uh, additional questions, I did open up the microphone so you can go ahead and ask. Um, we'll be on for the next few minutes. Otherwise, thank you for joining us today. Sure thing.